The Senate will come to order. Members, please stand for the prayer. Today's chaplain is our very own Senator Andrew Matthews from Senate District 15. And following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for this chance to come together to do the business before us. Lord, your word talks about how when you'd lift up your eyes and look on the multitudes, you're moved with compassion. And I ask that you'd give us that same compassion as we look on the multitudes around our district and some going through struggles and challenges like they've never seen before. Lord, would you move us with compassion? Would you give us wisdom for making the right decisions? Would you give us the courage to stand up uh, for what is needed, to fight for those who don't have a voice, and would you give us your inspiration on what choices should be made in the weeks and months ahead? Again, we ask for your healing on those that are sick. Pray that you would continue to strengthen and give courage to our doctors and healthcare workers that are doing incredible work right now in hospitals around this state and around this country. And we, bring, we pray this all for your honor and glory. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Secretary will take the roll. Senators Abler, Anderson B., Anderson P., Bach, Benson, Bigham, Carlson, Chamberlain, Champion, Clausen, Cohen, Swazinski, Dames, Dibble, Dreheim, Dietzik, Eaton, Eichhorn, Eakin, Franzen, Friends, Gazelka, Goggin, Hall, Herr, Hayden, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Ingebrigtsen, Isaacson, Jasinski, Jensen, Johnson, Kent, Kiftmeyer, Klein, Cran, Lane, Lang, Latz, Limmer, Little, Marty, Matthews, Miller, Nelson, Newman, Newton, Osmick, Pappas, Pratt, Rarick, Ralph, Rest, Rosen, Rood, Senjum, Simonson, Sparks, Thomasoni, Torres Ray, Utke, Weber, Westrom, Weger, Wickland. A quorum is present. Pursuant to Rule 14.1, the following members intend to vote under Rule 40.7. Senators Anderson B., Carlson, Clausen, Dames, Eaton, Frentz, Hall, Ingebrigtsen, Isaacson, Lane, Latz, Little, Newman, Newton, Pappas, Rest, Rosen, Rude, Senjum, Sparks, Torres Ray, Weber, Westrom, and Wicklin. And members, before we go to the agenda, just another quick reminder that we will be operating under the CDC and MDH guidelines again and exercising proper social distancing inside the chamber and out. A reminder to members who are in the remote locations, when you come to the chamber to vote, please enter through the side doors and exit through the front door. So enter through the side doors of the chamber, exit through the front door, and make sure you vote at your own desk. With that, 
We will begin on the Senate agenda today with the eighth order of business, introduction and first reading of Senate bills. Listed in today's introduction calendar are Senate files 4463 through 4489. We do have one change. Senate file 4464 will be referred to the Committee on Jobs and Economic Growth, Finance and Policy. These bills are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Moving to the ninth order of business, motions. Oh, Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate file number 4489 be laid on the table. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. We'll take a brief pause to gather the votes in the alternate locations. Receiving a sufficient number of aye votes, the motion prevails. We will now move to the ninth order of business, motions and resolutions. We have one author's motion listed in the agenda. We have one additional author's motion that will be read by the secretary. Senator Housley moves that the names of Senators Franzen and Jasinski be added as co-authors to Senate file number 4489. We will take the motion list, the author's motion listed in the agenda and the one read by the secretary as one motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. We will again take a brief pause to gather the votes in the alternate locations. Receiving a sufficient number of aye votes, the motion prevails. Remaining under motions and resolutions, Senator Gazelka. Uh, Mr. President, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bills to be made for special orders for immediate consideration. Uh, members, the sheet is on your desk. Members, the first bill up for consideration is number 20 on general order, Senate File 2184, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Senate File 2184 is a bill that we, we've been working on for a couple of years. The bill would allow prescriptions for erectile dysfunction, or ED, to be issued via telehealth visits. Right now, most drugs can be prescribed through telehealth, except for six types of drugs specifically require an in-person visit, and this drug happens to be one of the six. This bill does not lift the pro prohibition but it allows a telehealth visit for the purposes of a prescription only when the visit meets telehealth requirements set forth in Chapter 147, requiring the same standards of care as an in-person visit. My interest in this bill 
is for returning soldiers. They struggle with reintegration, and some have the additional burden of PTSD. What they have found is that 80% of the soldiers that have PTSD have also be suffer from ED. This could be a contributing fact factor to the 22, so 22 suicides a day that we are experiencing in the veteran community. This may make a difference in that number of suicides. As the Minnesota National Guard continues to deploy soldiers to harm's way, and now with the COVID-19 crisis, it is more important than ever to work through telemedicine whenever possible. I'll stand for any questions. I ask for your support. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, uh, we'll go to discussion on the bill. I'll call on Senator Klein first, uh, but for any members that are not in the chamber, if you wish to speak on the bill or offer any amendments, please let your room leader know and they can let the front desk know and we will make sure that you get added to the list to have discussion or offer an amendment. So discussion on Senate File 2184, Senator Klein. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Howell, for bringing the bill. And uh, I just want to express that, uh, in general, advancing telemedicine uh, has been a priority uh, of this Senate for many years. It's certainly the next necessary step in the health care delivery system. It, it turns out that the emergence of COVID-19 has forced our hand to move a little quicker on that, which is a good thing. Uh, it's the right way to deliver medicine, it's a safer way to deliver medicine, and it's a more equitable way to deliver medicine. I've been grateful for the help and support of Senator Benson and her leadership on moving telemedicine forward. Uh, and this is just one more example of uh, that effort. So thank you, Senator Howell, for the bill. Discussion on Senate File 2184. See no further discussion. The Secretary will give Senate File 2184 its third reading. Senate File Number 2184, a bill for an act relating to health, allowing telemedicine evaluations. Third reading. Members were on final discussion for Senate File 2184, Senator Hayden. Senator well, Hayden, I almost called you Senator Isaacson because yeah, I know the well, play. Uh, <laughs> Senator my Hayden. brother from another mother. But uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, and Senator Howe, thank you for bringing the bill. I, too, uh, with Senator Klein, um, um, have been thinking about telehealth, especially in the advent of COVID-19 and uh, how many communities uh, and people can get access uh, to health care uh, as it relates to this. Though I will say, uh, uh, Senator Howe and, and, and uh, those that are uh, in the majority caucus, I just find that at this time, uh, there's probably other more pressing needs that if we're going to bring us all together to get this done. I don't see why this couldn't have been part of an omnibus package that Senator Abler is trying to develop or Senator Benson or, or other places. I just think that uh, right now in the middle of a pandemic, uh, it would just be a much better and much wiser use of our time to focus on things uh, like microloans for businesses that are uh, failing or uh, making sure that we uh, get the money out in communities that are going to be disproportionately affected by uh, this pandemic. Uh, we hear numbers uh, all across the country uh, in the African American and, and other health disparate communities that really need uh, a lot of our help and a lot of our focus. So those, Senator, how I appreciate uh, the bill and I appreciate the concept of telehealth and uh, what you're trying to fix here. I, I would uh, hope that this body would uh, start to focus in on the more pressing needs, uh, what I feel like the more pressing needs, uh, as opposed to telehealth for erectile dysfunction. Thank you, Mr. President. Final discussion on Senate File 2184. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Well, I had not intended to speak, but I think the discussion uh, warrants that. Certainly, as comments have been made earlier about the um, incidence of COVID-19 and how that relates to how we are uh, deploying and implementing medicine in times of a panic, um, I agree. We need to have a much broader discussion about telemedicine or telehealth. Uh, so far, um, we are, I know I'm looking at that, I know others are too, and I think that is one of the things that we will see as a positive out of this pandemic that we are suffering through now, is we are forced 
to do and to look at telehealth in a broader sense. I am confident that we will do that in the future, and we do, I do believe that uh, it is not only more um, efficient, effective, and equal, it, it also allows all patients to access uh, physicians, experts, where they are, without travel, and uh, provides the necessary uh, services at the time and place that they need. So we will, uh, I'm sure that we will pursue additional telehealth uh, as we move forward. Any final discussion on Senate File 2184? Members were on final passage of Senate File 2184. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll. Members in the retiring room, members in the retiring room, retiring room, please come to the chamber and vote at your own desk and exit through the front doors of the chamber. Members in the East Gallery, uh, please make your way down to the chamber. Members in the President's office, please enter the chamber through the side doors, vote at your desk, and exit through the front door of the chamber. Members in Capitol Room 206, please make your way to the chamber. Room 203. I'm sorry, room 303. Members in room 303, please come to the chamber and vote at your desk.
Members in Capital Room 237, 237, please come to the chamber and vote. And in members in room 323, 323, please make your way down to the chamber and vote. I will now call on Senator Gazelka to report the members' votes who are voting remotely under uh, Rule 40.7. Thank Senator you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Bruce Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson B votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Gary Dames votes aye. Senator Dames votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Dan Hall votes aye. Senator Hall votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Bill Ingebretson votes aye. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Scott Newman votes aye. Senator Newman votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Julie Rosen votes aye. Senator Rosen votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Kerry Rood votes aye. Senator Rood votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Dave Senjum votes aye. Senator Senjum votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Bill Weber votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Tory Westrom votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. Senator Kett, whenever you're ready, you just stand up and I'll call on you. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I report an aye for Senator Carlson. Senator Carlson votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Greg Clausen. Senator Clausen votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Chris Eaton. Senator Eaton votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Nick Frentz. Senator Frentz votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Jason Isaacson. Senator Isaacson votes aye. 
Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Carolyn Lane. Senator Lane votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Ron Latz. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Matt Little. Senator Little votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Jerry Newton. Senator Newton votes aye. Senator Kent. I report a no for Senator Sandy Pappas. Senator Pappas votes no. Senator Kent. I report a no for Senator Ann Rest. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Dan Sparks. Senator Sparks votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Torres Ray. Senator Torres Ray votes aye. Senator Kent. Senator Melissa Wicklin votes aye. Senator Wicklin votes aye. Does that complete your votes? Yes. Okay. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 63 ayes and three nays, the bill is passed and it's titled agreed to. Members, the next bill up for consideration is number 52 on general orders, Senate file 3125, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, Senate file 3125 will ensure coverage for routine costs for individuals enrolled in an approved clinical trial uh, for medical assistance enrollees. For some patients, clinical trials offer the last best hope for a cure or treatment to extend their lives. Currently, there's over about 2,000 clinical trials available in Minnesota. Clinical trials make a difference in people's lives. Many times, they are that last chance at a cure for people suffering from life-threatening diseases. Minnesota law does not guarantee that Medicaid will continue coverage for that routine care if an indiv individual decides to enroll in a clinical trial. This bill, if passed, will give the Medicaid population the same freedom to enroll in a clinical trial as Medicare enrollees or individuals with commercial health plans. Everyone deserves access to a clinical trial, regardless of income. DHS has said that this bill does not need a fiscal note. 13 states and the District of Columbia, including our neighbor to the south, um, have already made this change. Minnesota should be added to this list. I would note that any costs incurred in the clinical trial are paid for by the uh, clinical trial funders. It is only those routine costs that would be paid for regardless of whether or not the, tr the uh, Medicaid patient were in a clinical trial that this bill is dealing with. This bill is supported by the American Cancer Society, the Association for Clinical Oncology, Be the Match, that is the National Marrow Donor Program, Breath of Hope Lung Foundation, Colon Cancer Coalition, Cancer Health Equity Network, Gillette Children's, Hennepin Healthcare, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Mayo Clinic, Medical Alley, Metro Minnesota Community Oncology Research Consortium, Minnesota Cancer Clinical Trials Network, Minnesota Medical Association, Minnesota Oncology, Minnesota Ovarian Cancer Alliance, Minnesota Public Health Association, Minnesota Society of Clinical Oncology, Sanford Health, and This is Medicaid. And now, members, I ask for your support. 
Members were on discussion for Senate File 3125, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Senate File 3125 will help. Almost everybody's eligible to participate in medical clinical trials. The difficulty is that there are sometimes other expenses for routine uh, visits you have to have, checkups aside from the the cost of the drugs itself or the clinical trial itself, and Medicaid population is about the only one that's not covered by this. It makes sense to do. It's also going to make the clinical trials better because it doesn't take a segment of the population and exclude them from it. So I urge your support. Further discussion on Senate File 3125. See no further discussion. The secretary will give Senate File 3125 its third reading. Senate File Number 3125, a bill for an act relating to medical assistance, providing coverage for routine patient costs that are incurred in the course of a clinical trial. Third reading. Any final discussion on the bill? Members were on final passage of Senate File 3125. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll. Members in the retiring room, please come to the chamber and vote. Members in the East Gallery, you can make your way down. While they're making their way down, members in the President's office, please come to the chamber and vote. The members in room 303 can make their way down to the chamber. 303, while they're making their way, way down, members in Capitol Office 237, please come to the chamber and vote.
Members in room 323 can make their way down to the chamber and vote. Room 323. I will now call on Senator Kent to report the members who are voting remotely under Rule 40.7. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. I report an aye for Senator Jim Carlson. Senator Carlson votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Greg Clausen. Senator Clausen votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Nick Frentz. Senator Frentz votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Jason Isaacson. Senator Isaacson votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Carolyn Lane. Senator Lane votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Ron Latz. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Matt Little. Senator Little votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Jerry Newton. Senator Newton votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Sandy Pappas. Senator Pappas votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Ann Rest. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Dan Sparks. Senator Sparks votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Patricia Torres Ray. Senator Torres Ray votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Melissa Wickland. Senator Wickland votes aye. We will now call on Senator Gazelka to report the members who are voting remotely under Rule 40.7. Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bruce Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson B votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Gary Dames votes aye. Senator Dames votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Dan Hall votes aye. Senator Hall votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Bill Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Scott Newman votes aye. Senator Newman votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Julie Rosen votes aye. Senator Rosen votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Kerry Rood votes aye. Senator Rood votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Dave Senjum votes aye. Senator Senjum votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Bill Weber votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Tory Westrom votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. My apologies for an oversight on my part. Uh, I would like to report that Senator Chris Eaton votes aye. Senator Eaton votes aye. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 67 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and it's titled agreed to. Remaining under motions and resolutions, Senator Gazelka.
Uh, Mr. President, I move that Senate File 4489 be taken from the table. On that motion, On that motion, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. We will take a brief pause to gather the votes from the remote from the alternate locations. Receiving a sufficient number of aye votes, the motion prevails. Senator Gazelka. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I move that an urgency be declared within the, measure, the meaning of Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of Minnesota with respect to Senate File Number 4489, and that the rules of the Senate be so far suspended as to give Senate File 4489 its second and third reading. Discussion and on that motion, final Senator Gazelka. Uh, Mr. President, this is uh, an opportunity to help the, some of the restaurants that are uh, allowed to have takeout orders. Uh, they now will also be able to uh, provide a bottle of wine or a six-pack of, of beer in the takeout. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I also uh, encourage members to support this bill um, and suspend uh, the rules. Um, I agree. Uh, this is a sec sector of our communities that have been particularly hard hit um, under current circumstances with this pandemic, and this is a little bit of relief that we can provide to support their businesses. Further discussion? See none. Uh, Senator Gazelka renews his motion to suspend the rules and declare an urgency uh, under, uh, let's see, for Senate File 4489. All those in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Opposed say no. We'll take a brief pause to capture the votes in the alternate locations. Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Rosen and Senator Senjum voted aye. Senator Rosen and Senator Senjum vote aye on the motion.
Receiving a sufficient number of aye votes, the motion prevails. The secretary will read the Senate file number for its second reading. Senate file number 4489. Second reading. Discussion on the bill, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, on March 16th, uh, Governor Walls, through his executive order, closed all of our restaurants and bars, and he extended the executive order on April 8th. As a, re as a result of these closures, many of our bars and restaurants across the state have a surplus of beer and wine they've been unable to sell. This bill is designed to allow bars and restaurants with a current on-sale liquor license to sell beer and wine with a food takeout order. This is something that we can do right now. These businesses are hurting. They need to get cash in the door to be able to feed their families. This new law would allow for bars and restaurants to sell up to 72 fluid ounces of beer, which is equivalent to a standard six-pack, and 750 milliliters of wine, which is equivalent to a standard bottle per takeout order. The beer and wine must be in its original packaging, and the bar or restaurant cannot sell beer or wine as a standalone takeout order. The beer and wine must accompany a food takeout order. Additional provisions in this bill addresses municipalities, third-party delivery services, and notifications to insurance companies. A, a municipality may pass a resolution to opt out of this law. If a municipality takes no action, the law will go into effect. Third-party delivery services, such as, but not limited to, Uber Eats, DoorDash, and others, are not allowed to deliver beer and wine with a takeout food order. Bars and restaurants must follow the current off-sale laws. This means if a bar or restaurant is open until midnight, they cannot sell takeout beer and wine beyond midnight. Bars and restaurants must notify that they're insured that they are making off-sales. And this bill does not prohibit a bar or restaurant owner from incurring an additional cost from their insurer. An employee or bar or restaurant must confirm the person picking up the takeout order is at least 21 years of age. This, uh, this bill was, uh, is supported by the Hospitality Minnesota, League of Minnesota Cities, and Association of Minnesota Counties. It's bipartisan. I want to thank everybody for their work on it. Um, Senator Dames, uh, Senator Hoffman, Jasinski, Senator Franzen, and Senator Anderson, uh, and Representative John Kosnick in the House, and Lori Halverson, and, and Speaker Hortman. So with that, uh, members, I'm asking for a green vote. Members, we're on discussion for Senate File 4489, Senator Anderson, and then Senator Dibble is on deck. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, the uh, pain of the economy for many Minnesotans is real right now, but for our small businesses and our restaurants and bars in particular, it's both devastating and heartbreaking. One of our favorite restaurants in Plymouth, uh, Rock Elm Taver Tavern, the owner, uh, Troy Redding, has been in close contact and sent the following email to me earlier this week. Uh, and I think it's really um, a great example of, of what pain they're going through. Senator Anderson, we are currently operating three of our four restaurants with limited hours during uh, doing curbside service. Holman's Table in St. Paul has been close closed completely since March 16th. I have had to lay off 130 employees with 14 currently working and being paid a reduced wage. Over the past four weeks, we have been averaging about 20% of our pre-closure weekly sales. And at that volume, I'm able to cover my cost of goods, pay my 14 people a reduced wage, pay CAM and utilities, yielding about $1,000 a week in operating profit. That being said, I'm delinquent in rent, not doing any maintenance, have about $80,000 in accounts payable, and I'm paying interest only on my notes. Curbside pickup has dropped 40% following Governor Wall's stay-at-home directive. We are trying different things, but it's very difficult to gain traction. If business doesn't improve, I'm gonna to have to consider cutting further hours and workers. He is pleading for us to be able to sell beer and wine with food for takeout, and it'll make an immediate impact, even though it's maybe small, but it has to happen soon. The circumstances our restaurant and bars are operating under, if they are able to open after this crisis uh, ends, is crushing. To say their lives have been disrupted is an understatement. The stress for them is bigger than any virus. This is their livelihood. 
This legislation is one small way that we can help the restaurant and bar industry during these unprecedented times. It will help give them an additional revenue without adding labor to the curbside model. Our restaurants and bars didn't choose this path for their businesses. Some of them undoubtedly won't be able to survive. Members, like many of you, I start every day with a little prayer and a hope that I can make a little difference in easing the crisis for our economy and our businesses and our people as a whole. But we have a lot more to do outside of just this. I certainly wish the liquor would have been included, but that wasn't part of the deal. In my opinion, this is a no-brainer. These liquor laws are within the specific authority of the legislature, and the governor has stated that he will sign the bill. Let's authorize the selling of wine and beer for takeout by our restaurants and bars today. Thank you. Further discussion on the bill. Next, we have Senator Dibble, followed by Senator Dietzik. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to offer the A50, A50 amendment. Senator Dibble offers the A50 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dibble moves to amend Senate file number 4489 as follows, page one after line three, insert. This is the A50 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Um, the A50 amendment is the subject of a, a bill uh, Senate file 3697, which uh, I introduced earlier in the session. Um, I'm bringing this forward in the hopes that uh, we ultimately do get to uh, a larger uh, liquor bill, uh, as we do traditionally. As we know, um, we had a number of these local bills that didn't make the, uh, get past the finish line last year, and that has a real negative consequence for uh, a number of our businesses. This is actually uh, for a business uh, and it's a small, minor uh, tweak uh, to uh, allowing the city of Minneapolis to make a small adjustment to their licensure laws for an establishment by the name of Hounds and Hops, uh, which is actually in Senator Champion's district, but the owner lives in my district. And uh, all it would simply allow to have happen is uh, that an area, indoor area of that facility uh, would be allowed, the customers would be allowed to bring their beverages and their food out to an area separated from where uh, the space that needs to remain sanitary is, uh, where folks can uh, bring their dogs and let them run free, and then they can uh, watch their dogs interact while they're enjoying their comestibles. So, um, Mr. President, um, it's a small matter. Um, I understand there's some sensitivities on this bill, and it's highly negotiated, but I wanted to call attention to this subject. I understand Senator Dames is listening, so I'm kind of communicating with him as well hoping that uh, we do get back to, uh, to this business, and I know there are a number of others um, that uh, have issues like this in their district. Thankfully, in Minneapolis, we don't have to bring these special liquor bills anymore. We changed the charter, no more of those to torment us and, and uh, occupy our time in committee or on the floor, but sometimes we do have minor adjustments that would be a benefit uh, to Minneapolis and, and other local businesses. Thank you. Members, discussion on the A50 amendment. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President and uh, Senator Dibble for bringing forth this amendment. Um, it's, a, it's a delicate balance right now. Um, there are a lot of amendments and a lot of uh, different businesses or, or folks that want to add something to it. This, I am so hoping that we can get some sort of process through deed that we can, businesses can upload their idea, how they can open their business tomorrow safely and to keep the public safe. Um, and this is one of those ideas, Senator Dibble, it's, it's not a bad idea. Um, but this bill took all hands on deck to get just this much done, just to be able to get a bottle of wine and a six pack of beer. Uh, it was back and forth between League of Minnesota Cities and the Licensed Beer Association, or Licensed Beverage Association, the beer wholesalers. Um, Hospitality Minnesota. It was a lot, of, a lot of negotiating, and we barely, barely got this much. So, as much as I would like to discuss this further, and as much as I would like to take it, um, it's at this point in time, and, and I'd love to have it in, hear it in the committee, and talk through this. But as for this, I'm going to have to oppose the amendment. Thanks. Further discussion on the A. 
50 amendments. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you, Senator Howes. I appreciate um, uh, your appreciation for the amendment um, and your um, desire uh, to have it heard later this session, hopefully. Um, and I understand the stakeholders um, uh, were more flexible than they typically are on these matters, and so we do have the underlying bill in front of us, which is a good thing, which my constituents want uh, very, very much. I've gotten many emails uh, encouraging that we take this step today. So, Mr. President, I would withdraw the A50 amendment. Senator Dibble withdraws the A50 amendment. Members were back on Senate File 4489. Senator Dietzik is next on the list, followed by Senator Abler. Senator Dietzik. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and I have the A51 amendment. Senator Dietzik offers the A51 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dietzik moves to amend Senate file number 4489 as follows, page two after line 15, insert. This is the A51 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, the craft brewery and the craft distillery industry are uh, very important to our state. They are a booming industry. They employ over 1,500 full-time and 700 part-time employees. And since COVID, that has been cut in half. My district in uh, Northeast and Southeast Minneapolis was the original liquor di district in Minneapolis. I have over 10 tap rooms, three brew pubs, four distilleries, and I have two more distilleries right across the street. So this has, um, this COVID virus has truly devastated my district, just like several other districts across the state have been devastated. These small businesses are hurting. Their employees are hurting. For many of them, it is about survival. Some of the brew pubs in the tap rooms have had to destroy product. This is perishable product, so they have had to destroy it. So they need help, and they are asking for help. I've had uh, many emails supporting this takeout liquor bill, uh, Senate File 4489, but I've also heard from all of my tap rooms and distilleries and all of their employees, many who live in my area, wanting and needing help. And so what my amendment does is it allows the micro distilleries to sell one more bottle. So it's, it's not a huge amount, it's just one more bottle. And then it allows the small craft breweries to be able to sell similar to what the restaurants are now being able to sell. I think this is fairness. Again, we have all of these um, industries that are hurting. In my, again, my district, we have tap rooms and distilleries, and I have bars, and I have restaurants, and I have many James Beard restaurants uh, winners. And so I am torn because I really like this bill, but I think we could make it better. And so um, with that, I offer the A51 amendment and ask for your support. Discussion on the A51 amendment, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President, and Senator Dietzik, uh, thank you for being a voice for the micro distilleries and our, our small craft breweries throughout the state. Um, they do need help. I've been hearing from mine. I've got Lift Bridge in my district, and believe me, I tried and tried to get more done, but we, in, the, in this state of COVID-19 that we're in right now, we can only get so much done, and we need to do what we can get done uh, today. And this is, this is the bill and the shape of the form that it took. We've got to get it to pass the House also. I'm hoping going forward, Senator Dietrich, you and I can work on getting some quick relief to our micro distilleries and our craft brewers. But as of today, we're going to have to oppose your amendment. Further discussion on the amendment, Senator Dietrich. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Housley. Um, I appreciate um, this bill, Senate file, 4489, again, that will help a lot of the um, restaurants and bars in my district. Um, but this is about fairness, and so I do want to keep moving forward. I don't, I understand that, you know, if amendment goes on, that that might be a problem for Senate File 4489, and so I don't want to hear that. So as again, I said, I am very torn because these businesses are hurting, and these businesses are people, and they are families, and these are families that are hurting. They are laid off. They are struggling to stay alive. These are businesses that were booming one day, and then the next day they're not. And so we really need to work to help them. And so um, it, is, it is with a very heavy heart that I will pull the amendment. 
um, but I am going to say to my small businesses and my distilleries and my brew pubs that I'm going to continue fighting and I'm going to continue working and I look forward to working with Senator Housley and I will call Senator Dames and anybody else that wants to talk because they need help like so many industries across our state that need help and so um, with that I pull the amendment and thank you members. Senator Diesick withdraws the A51 amendment. Members were back on Senate file 4489. Senator Abler is next on the list, followed by Senator Thomas Sony. Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members and uh, Governor Walls and the commissioners and all the people who are watching at home. And from my emails, uh, which are actually increasing in intensity and desperation, uh, I'm sad I have to stand up again. I would presume that a lot of the Senate staff is tired of hearing from me. This is my fourth comment in a row when we've been here. Um, but I really want to uh, commend people for sharing in the concerns. Uh, thank you, Senator Dietzik, for pointing out how people are struggling. Uh, Senator Dibble for pointing out how this is a, really a problem. Senator Kent for pointing out that um, people need a little relief. Uh, and it's not just a partisan matter at all. There is no end of people who are concerned about what's going on. And Senator uh, uh, Housley, this is exactly the kind of bill we need more of. Finding a way to move our way through this uh, tragedy and into a way that uh, can make some sense. The idea of constrained optimization, this is exactly what this bill is, where we take a step and a step and you start out with the ones that are relatively easy and move into the ones that are more complicated. We're not ready to open stadiums, but we are ready to allow people to buy a little beer uh, when they go over for their takeout. We are ready for people to uh, play golf on unattended golf courses. We're ready for car washes to open that are automated. And we're ready for businesses that are at least as good as Walmart to be available to go buy shoes at. I think it is preposterous, Mr. President, and to the whole rest of the state who's watching, that we allow these giant stores to be open, and they, and they could well be, that are making incremental moves to more and more sanitation. But I would not bring somebody that was elderly I loved into one of those places, because I believe they are dangerous. At the same time, we say, oh no, these one-person shops in Anoka and Stillwater and Lakeville cannot be open because they present a danger to somebody. I would ask the governor and the commissioner and whomever to show me the modeling that says when they open Greenhaven Golf Course uh, in a way that requires no staff, where they sanitize everything, how that adds one death to any model. I will ask them to tell me about when they open the Anoka Car Wash, which has one guy at the gate and the person's inside spraying off the water and we're locked safely in our windows, or we might have a pass which requires no uh, connection at all, that that somehow adds to a death toll in any way. And Senator Hayden, I have a great respect for your mama, and I would do nothing to imperil her and, or anybody else. And, but every day, people are getting more and more discouraged. This is, the, a, this is a glimmer of hope, which I hope everybody votes for, and we can even do more of this sort of thing. But governor, commissioners, this is in your hands. The, when people look back at the business that they're going to sell, I just talked to a man who's going to sell his million dollar business uh, because he's unable to do it. Um, and it's just really, really too bad. Secondly, I want to offer a second topic. I got a call from a very active constituent, and he's really concerned about this reporting line. And he's concerned because he's afraid of where it's going to go. And if we are one Minnesota, and I really believe we are, Governor, I think we could be one Minnesota, but we're not, we shouldn't be a snitch on your neighbor, Minnesota. In East Germany, they had 200,000 people that reported on their neighbors, and people were drug off. And so that is not where we want to go. This, this is the beginning of that. And so if there are people been uh, calling the police over a man in their, in their cigar shop who is doing paperwork. By the way, you're allowed to do paperwork in your cigar shop. The police came and they hassled this guy. Is that what we're about? That's not going to help people feel better. So, Mr. President, I uh, thank you for the chance to comment. And uh, please, please, let's be sensible about this thing. Let's do constrained um, optimization in more ways than just this and move Minnesota back. Thank you. Next, we have Senator Tomasoni, followed by Senator Jasinski.
Senator Tomasoni. Thank you, um, Mr. President. I have a I have the A1 amendment, Mr. President. Senator Tomasoni offers the A1 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Tomasoni moves to amend Senate file number 4489 as follows. Page 2, after line 15, insert this is the A1 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Tomasoni. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, members, the, the A1 amendment, what it does is it, it, um, it adds to the bill uh, because the bill picks winners and losers. And um, what, what, the, what the bill is doing is, is allowing restaurants that serve food to now sell on-sale liquor and to, um, uh, that they normally wouldn't be able to sell under the conditions that, that we're talking about right now because, because this is actually takeout liquor. So um, we have all these little bars that are closed down, cannot sell anything, um, and they are at a disadvantage here for the simple reason that um, they can't sell anything. But yet we're, we're allowing their normal competitors to be selling liquor um, with, these, with their takeout orders. I, for the life of me, have no idea why anybody would buy a $40 bottle of wine from the restaurant that, in their takeout when they could get it for 10 bucks at the liquor store. So I don't think the bill is going to work anyway. But the fact of the matter is, is what these little uh, bars are doing is they can all sell things like pizzas when they're open. But they can't sell them now. And so what they want to do is they want to be able to at least do some off-sales and on-sale selling at, at the same time by offering a hamburger or a hot dog on a grill outside the bar. And when you got a little places in these little towns like Tom and Jerry's in Chisholm or Poppers in Virginia or Margie's Roosevelt in Eveleth who are closed down completely and are selling nothing but maybe some off sale every now and then, but they're not selling much of that either because people are just going to the liquor store. Well, they want to be able to sell some on sale as well. So by allowing them to sell some, um, some burgers or some hot dogs uh, on a grill outside the bar, they can then sell some of these six packs as well. And so this just includes more people, gives more people the opportunity to do exactly what we want the, the restaurants to do, and it includes some little bars and restaurants. And who knows, maybe they won't even do it, but the fact of the matter is it gives somebody an opportunity to do it. And I just think that, that this is a, a fairness issue and this should be included in the bill. Discussion on the A-1 amendment, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President and uh, Senator Thomas Sony. Uh, I think of Margie up at the Roosevelt often um, and how her business must be hurting because of Governor Wall's executive order to close all of our bars and restaurants. Um, I, I would love, love to help all of our businesses across the state, but you can only do so much so fast. And like I said before, um, this is what is agreed upon. It has to pass the House. Any amendments that go on, it won't pass and we'll take down the whole thing. So I would, I would love to um, work with you going forward on something like this to help Margie and the Roosevelt and all of our small businesses that can only serve pizzas. Um, but this bill only allows for uh, what's in the language right now and not for anything more. Well, Mr. President, and Senator Tomasoni, Senator Hosley, that's what's wrong with this um, process that we are going through nowadays and trying to pass bills with only two or three people negotiating them and nobody else being included. And, um, and, and quite frankly, had there been more people talking about this bill, this particular provision might have been included in the bill. Um, I, I, will Senator Housley yield for a question? Senator Housley will yield. Senator Tomasoni. Senator Housley, is there going to be another liquor bill in this session? Senator Housley. Uh, Mr. President and Senator Tomasoni, I am hoping that we can make a lot more changes to a lot of the bills that will be coming through quickly here, but this is all we can do right now. Um, I don't know what the House's schedule is, when they're coming back, but I would like to work with you and Senator Dietzik and Senator Dibble and Senator Kent and Franzen um, on maybe lifting the executive order and having some of these businesses um, come back slowly and safely. Well, Mr. President, Senator Tomasoni. Yeah, Senator Housley, I, I for the life of me have absolutely no idea how this amendment could possibly take down your bill because it, all it does is do exactly what your bill wants 
wants to do. It, it, it allows bars to do what restaurants are doing. And I, I would think that we would take a look at something like this and say, let's just put it on, because how can it possibly hurt the rest of the bill? And I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm aghast that we're sitting here on the Senate floor and saying that we can't add amendments to bills because then the bill's dead. That makes absolutely no sense. Why not, why not allow the process to go forward like it normally does and say, hey, you know, if amendment goes on a bill, let's vote the bill on its merits with the amendment. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm very, very frustrated that we are, that we are being told if, a bill, if an amendment goes on a bill, the bill's dead and the bill won't pass, and then everybody in the restaurant business is going to be mad at us. And I, I just am, am, am totally aghast that, that we're actually doing this kind of stuff. But um, members, I don't want to kill the bill either. And, and uh, while I don't think this amendment would kill the bill, I think it would make the bill better. Um, in the spirit of being a team player, I'm going to withdraw the A1 amendment, but I also want to make sure that um, this is uh, dealt with in the future because um, these little bars that can't open and can't sell anything are being killed right now, and they have absolutely nowhere to go, and they need to have some kind of ability to make some kind of sales so that they can, they can pay for the, bill, the, the, uh, the, the light bill and the, and the mortgage and, and everything else, the insurance, because so far the small business loans haven't come through. They haven't gotten any money. They don't have one penny in their bank accounts from all these loans that are supposed to be out there. And and they are suffering terribly, and so we need to do something for them, and we need to try and fix, figure out how to get these places back open. So with that, I'll withdraw the A1 amendment. Senator Tomasoni withdraws the A1 amendment. We're back on the underlying bill, Senate File 4489. Senator Jasinski, followed by Senator Klein. Members, if there are any other amendments, please let the desk know. If there aren't any other amendments, we'll go to third reading uh, after Senator Klein, and then I have a long list of members who would like to speak after third reading. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Senator Housley, uh, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, I come from a family business, a bar business, that have been in business for 90 years, fourth generation. And what it is doing to our bar and restaurant industry in the state of Minnesota is devastating. This is only one small step that will help. And there are several other businesses, mom and pop businesses across this state that are hurting just as bad. Uh, the hair salons and, and going on and on and on, these businesses. We can open these businesses safely. We know social distancing. We can do this. Minnesota needs to reopen these businesses. I will guarantee you there will be 30 percent of these businesses will never open again. And it is very sad for a 90-year-old business that probably will never open up again. We need to open Minnesota. Governor, we need to do this now. Our businesses, our people are not going to survive in this state. We need to do it. Senator Abler had some great comments, and I agree with every one of them. I agree with every amendment here today. We need to do what we can do to open our state again and let people live in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Housley, for your hard work. Further discussion, Further discussion on the bill, Senator Klein. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Housley, for the bill. Uh, I rise mostly to speak to the comments that have been made by Senators Abler and Jasinski and that I've heard from home watching the proceedings over the last couple of weeks. I haven't been coming into sessions, Mr. President, and that is because on my shifts I regularly enter the rooms and care for patients directly who are actively ill with COVID-19, coughing and septic and febrile. I didn't think it was a good idea for me to come in and expose other members and their families to my level of risk. Furthermore, I think the entire fact that we can con congregate here violates the spirit and the letter of Executive Order 2035, advising us to stay in place. Nevertheless, I come in because I think it's important that you know that my colleagues know the experience of healthcare workers where I work, and you can factor that into the decisions you make going forward. I would just counsel us all 
to summon the virtues of caution and skepticism and a bit of military planning as we move forward. You know, this all started with the president saying that everyone who wants a test can get a test. And I don't bring that up to be a smart aleck or to score points, but it rankles still because I still see patients in the emergency department regularly who come in and are afraid and are febrile and have had a cough and have body aches and they don't get a test because they don't have enough. And they go home with advice to take care of themselves and sequester themselves, drink lots of fluids. If they have trouble breathing, give us a call back. They're afraid for their families, they're afraid for their children, and that is the very best medicine we can offer them. We don't have PPEs to give them, personal protective equipment, we don't have a vaccine or an advised medicine. Members, that's how medicine is practiced in the most primitive and impoverished nations in the world, and that is now how medicine is practiced in the heart of downtown Minneapolis, a stone's throw from the University of Minnesota. That is what we are come to with this illness. Yesterday, our ICU admissions for COVID-19 jumped in one day by 24% members. Jumps in ICU admissions reflect the behaviors that we were doing as a society three weeks ago. So this is the ripple from what we were doing and how we were behaving three weeks ago. I want you to reflect on that when you consider your advice for our changes in activity today. If we were to continue a 24% daily increase in hospital ICU beds, for COVID-19, we would overwhelm our current ICU capacity in one week, and we would overwhelm our reserve ICU capacity in two weeks. That is when members, that is when young doctors, younger than me, start making decisions about who gets a ventilator and who must stay on the floor and die. Those are extremely real decisions and they will be made if we don't do this right. Furthermore, at the Hennepin County Medical Center and across Minnesota, we are running short on sedative drugs. Simple sedatives for that when people go on a ventilator, they are, don't experience discomfort or awareness of the tremendous trauma they are enduring. So we are faced with the prospect also of putting people on ventilator machines in the ICU who are fully awake and aware of the circumstances that surround them. We do not have nearly enough N95 masks, the type of high filtration mask you see on my arm. So people are going, staff members, custodial workers, food service workers, nurses, doctors are going into rooms with people with COVID-19 who are coughing with a simple face mask, which we know does not have the filtration capacity to filter viruses. They're going in there because it's their job, and they're going in there afraid. A young woman physician on my service wrote a group email to all of us which we're sending these days to sustain each other. She wrote one yesterday talking about how she had lost a patient earlier this week to COVID-19, died in the ICU, died alone because we can't have guests in the hospital these days, died alone. And for the first time in her brief career, she broke down in the ICU and cried. She was sad for her patient. She felt helpless. She was afraid for her husband and her two young children at home. I hear stories like that, and then I hear that we have national and state leaders saying that medical staff are stealing or diverting personal protective equipment. I hear people say that hospitals and staff are exaggerating or even falsifying diagnoses to manipulate people or to grasp power or to line their pockets. We've heard leaders say that we are going overboard on how much we use personal protective equipment and people are using them unnecessarily. I would ask and implore this body not to speculate recklessly either about motives or the trajectory of this illness and do not undercut the recommendations of the CDC in this. I value and honor the advocacy that you have for your local golf course. I have one too and for your local car wash and for your taverns. And we ultimately do have to open our economy. We know that economic hardship for Minnesota families is a threat to this state in the same way that the virus is. But we can't open it with Panglossian projections or by accusing healthcare providers of greed and chicanery. You know, it's often stated that uh, this is a military type situation. We are soldiers on a field against a united enemy and I think that's an accurate analogy. I would say that if this is a military operation and we are in a war against COVID-19 and this was the Civil War, we're at Bull Run, people. We are in April of the first year. 
We've had some minor losses, but we have big battles ahead. I would also say the military operations are best carried out when all the soldiers agree a, and sustain the same objective, when they work in harmony, and when there is unanimous organization, as there was at D-Day with Eisenhower. We need to all be rowing the boat in the same direction. We can open our economy, but we can only do it, Mr. President, when we have adequate testing capacity, which we do not have now, and when we have adequate personal protective equipment for the workers that are going to go out there and do it. Mr. President, Minnesota is well reputed to be the smartest and the healthiest and the bravest state. The spirit of Minnesota is always ennobling and elevating. We have seen moments during this period of singular tenderness and optimize. I've seen the interns on my internal medicine service create a fruit basket and a gift basket for the custodial workers who have to come in and pick up the robes that we cast off after we enter a room. Minnesotans are looking out for neighbors. That's what we do and that's what we're doing best in this time. Mr. President, I would ask members in the chamber to bring down the temperature, bring down the rhetoric, and let's work together to do this right. Thank you. Next on the list, I have Senator Kent, and then I'm planning to go to third reading unless there uh, are any notifications to the front desk or myself. And then we have a long list of members who would like to speak after third reading. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, I, uh, after uh, Senator Klein's remarks, I thought about not rising because it was so powerful and such powerful testimony from someone who is truly on the front lines of this work that we're doing in terms of treating patients and dealing with their illnesses and their families and, um, and not prepared to do it. We know that um, we do not have the supplies that we need to take care of all of our first responders all of our healthcare professionals, everyone who should have access to what they need in order to deal with this virus that is spreading throughout our communities. But I rise because I wanted to respond to something that was said on the floor, um, talking about wanting to open more businesses. There is such a false dichotomy out here about this discussion, as if some people just want to lock everything down and keep it locked down and we don't want to open up any more businesses. We are here in this moment because we are trying to expand opportunities for our businesses. And many of us wish we could go further, including, I might add, Governor Walls, who has been very vocal. If you listen to him speak, he has a real sense of urgency in trying to do this. And the agencies that manage this also do as well. But they also know we have to do it safely. And so yes, it is going to take some time. And we know that that time is hurtful to the businesses in our communities and to the people and the families who own them. Nobody takes this lightly. I want to say two things. First of all, I want to share um, an email. I wasn't going to share this, but um, the comments about salons as one of the businesses that should be opened came up. I happened to get into an interesting little Twitter exchange about salons the other night because like a lot of women, I'm dealing with it in my own life, trimming my own bangs. Um, but it's okay for me because I cherish the woman who has taken care of my hair for many, many years and the three little boys that she's raising. And I know that being protecting each other is more important, a bigger, higher priority than my hair. Um, I also know that when we're together, we are in close proximity for a lot of time, and I don't see how we could do that safely. Um, so. That's my opinion as a customer. But I got um, an email actually from someone in Senator Box district uh, who writes, and I'm gonna share some of what she wrote. I'm gonna edit it because I wanna protect her privacy. But she says, hello, I am a salon owner, licensed salon manager, and licensed advanced esthetician. I am a workaholic and I love my career and my clients. And she's writing in response to an op-ed that was published by three different senators um, that ran in the Star Tribune. I want to express my personal opinion about this situation. I believe that our industry is hurting right now, and people working in this industry are desperate and panicking for financial reasons. We are in a field where there isn't much offered in the form of health insurance and benefits. I have worked as an employee, renter, and salon owner. Financially, it's a bummer. However, to open salons back up would spread this virus like wildfire. Her caps. Our safety and practices are below what is needed in order to keep us safe as well as the public. 
I do not want to get sick, although I am a normal, healthy person with a strong immune system, probably from working closely with the public for 18 plus years behind the chair and years of waitressing before that. I don't want to be a carrier, spreading it to all types of clients, ultimately being responsible for their deaths. I also don't want to be responsible for bringing it home to my family. I feel as though a few haircuts and or a few bucks is not worth loss of life and heartache. Please take this message into consideration when thinking of our industry. And I would add one other thing that has um, come out recently in some of the news out of New York. I thought this was really interesting. Um, I believe it was New York Presbyterian Hospital as part of the University of Columbia system um, did a study, did testing among their maternity patients young, healthy women coming in to give birth, not in there for any reasons directly related to coronavirus. Um, they did tests on 200 of these patients, and when they did, got those results, 15% of those patients were positive in that test and asymptomatic. And so you have healthcare workers coming in to help deliver new babies with mothers and their families going through labor, um, not aware that the virus is there because there's no sign of it, but it turns out 15% of those patients had the virus. And so as they went through their process, and probably they are not fully wearing the PPE that you see on the COVID wards, then they go to another patient. And I'm sure they are doing their best to to use best practices to, to be clean and safe. But we don't know, and that's the point. And so I go back to the original idea here. We need to do what we can to support our small businesses, but we have to do it safely. We have to have more testing. We have to have more information. This is not an either-or proposition. We need to support our businesses. We need to support our small businesses, absolutely but we can't really fully reopen this economy until we effectively deal with this virus. And I think our job here, and we're doing it today in this particular segment with this one bill, and I know we're gonna keep doing more of it, and we should, our job is to do it in a way that is responsible and protects our ability to manage what is happening, because as Senator Klein has just very thoroughly outlined, we are not done with this. Even though you can look at some communities across this country and see they're on the downside of this curve, we are not. Uh, so, thank you. Members, uh, the Secretary will give Senate File 4489 its third reading. Senate File Number 4489, a bill for an act relating to liquor allowing certain on-sale licensees to make off-sales off of liquor. Third reading. All right, members, I have a, a lengthy list here. We're going to start with Senator Johnson, followed by Senator Herr. Senator Johnson and Senator Herr is on deck. Senator Johnson. It is now. There it is. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, appreciate the Senate file 4489 coming forward. I think it's a response to our small businesses that have really been aching for some relief here. But I think there's an issue that we have with this, uh, Senate file 4489. Um, and that's the result that we're gonna get here. So we have shut down these businesses in an effort to protect our citizens against COVID-19. We've shut them down, we've put them in a position where they are aching and hurting. And yet we, we do something like this, um, which, which is, opens up our businesses to serving alcohol, which kills, uh, you know, it's roughly about 1,700 people a year across the state of Minnesota. So although I, I understand that our businesses need help, I don't think this is the appropriate way of doing it. I think if we really want to help our businesses, we got to be opening them up in a way that's safe, that's productive, that's protective to the individuals who are going to be working there and also going to be using the services of that business. And to me, this is, this is a little bit of an irony that we focus so much time and effort 
on making sure that we can get alcohol out the doors of our restaurants, but we're still trying to protect individuals across the state and doing all those things we can to save each and every life. Uh, so with that, Mr. President, uh, I thank you for your time. Next on the list is Senator Herr, followed by Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator Herr. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. President and members, uh, for allowing me to uh, um, address in the third reading here. Um, and just want to let uh, Senator Housley and members here know that I, was, I will vote yes for this bill and I will support it. But I want to point out a few things since COVID-19 number one came up. I express my fear as an Asian American being targeted during this time, you know, that if a multicultural phone line should be open to address this issue. It did, but it needed extra resource. And during COVID-2, I did express that there need to be more outreach to community that are, are marginalized, are not being able to connect with our mainstream media. And the word come out from this body was that, Senator Herr, we need your guidance and leadership. And beside that, I've been fighting for the microloans for small businesses. All that is that, Senator Hurd, just wait, just wait, we're gonna get there. And yes, I will support this bill, but why, why should we wait for all this issue that are, are in state, are, are in, in immediate needs? Micro business loan need to be out there right now. I've been talking to Representative Robbins and when I talk about micro-business loan as, as who I am, you might thinking about, I'm just mentioning about micro-business loan that may have language barrier. Yes, I'm a strong advocate for that, but I'm talking about micro-business loan for everybody, all Minnesotans. And when I was talking to Representative Robbins in her, about her district, her district facing the same thing, micro-business loan, because I asked her whether she her constituents had got the money or had made an effort to apply. They said they have tried, but they had to get someone else to help them, get a lawyer who helped them to do all the paperwork, go through the process. Well, those who have language barrier will have, you know, the same challenge and even more. And so I hope that the other body will, the other caucus will support us on micro business loan very, very soon. Because Mom and pop business in my district are closing. The only food venue that provided in my district are the fast food restaurant. When I want to get a decent meal, you know, I have to travel outside my district to Woodbury, to Maplewood, San Wigger district, and, and uh, Santa Kent district for that. So if we don't support our microeconomy, High tides raise our ship. That's an old American saying. It will hurt us in the long run. So I hope that the other caucus will see the immediate needs for supporting micro business. And I, I know that that's in the plan, but I hope that is soon. Um, before we, I would prefer that we support micro business first before micro steely. But I will vote for it too because. There are micro district in my district, and I just want to express my frustration over this, and during, especially during COVID-19. Uh, I really appreciate what Senator Klein just mentioned, that we have to see this as we are affected by war. And I'm nervous. I did express my fear here. Uh, I express my worries here because I have seen a country fall apart. You know, and I don't want to go so much detail. I want to reserve my uh, harsh life experience to, to a different day. But um, 
I'm with you, certain clients. I think you make a good point. I mean, you, 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 your pre words earlier, no one can say it better. So I just want to express my a few points here today, and thank you all. Next, we have Senator Kiffmeyer, followed by Senator Ralph. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President and members. So I'm going to address the Senate file 4489 shortly. But as a nurse, I also wanted to respond to the issues that COVID-19 brings about. In particular, I want to say that there are other deaths right now. There are people who have died, matter of fact, dramatic increase from traffic deaths during this COVID shutdown. There are people, many of them have died from the seasonal flu, matter of fact, three under the age of six. There are people who are dying now due to mental health. And increasingly in our hospitals, they're seeing more and more people coming in because for a while you can stuff it, for a while you can do that but pretty soon their emotional needs and other things are bringing them into crisis. Some of them, as we know, as I did research and the statistics, when the unemployment rate goes up, so do suicides. The story just recently of a stay-at-home family and the wife walked out to the garage. There was the, her husband throwing a rope over the rafter. She caught him in time. These are real stories, too. These are really true stories. I get hurt sometimes when I hear about the family member who contacted me. Their parent was in hospice, very, very ill from cancer, very soon to pass away, but did pick up COVID and they knew some form of pneumonia might be the straw that would tip them over into not being able to live. But they expected that. What hurt them so was that on the death certificate, it was written COVID-19. In their family history, when they look at the important medical records, to not have the fact that cancer was really what brought them into hospice that cancer was really what brought him into the situation. And yes, COVID was a contributor, but they didn't feel it was a cause, and they felt that the family record would not be accurate. Those are important. I watched a video yesterday, a replay of the governor's press briefing, and the commissioner of administration, Commissioner Alice Roberts Davis, talked about how they had plenty of PPE. They'd finally caught up with it. They had enough. They had it in the warehouse. They were distributing it. I assure you, anybody out there that doesn't have, as a health care provider on the front lines, does not at this time have their PPE, their personal protection equipment, that is outrageous. They should have it. But what I heard from the commissioner yesterday is they do. So let's get it out there to these people. There is no way that they should be put in harm's way. For them in particular, the frequent uh, connections for them and the viral overload uh, for them is very substantial. Going to something a little bit different, though, in regards to Senate File 4489. I've had a few emails that talked about, well, this isn't fair to our liquor stores. I assure you folks, our liquor stores are doing a booming business, a very thriving business. The problem is the restaurants who normally will sell cans of beer and bottles of wine during this particular time are not able to provide that, which greatly harms their ability to stay. And I don't believe it does any harm to being able to have those things included with the food. This just makes sense. All of the other amendments, by the way, uh, to mention on this bill, as Senator Housley, thank you for this bill. Uh, the city, so the city of Minneapolis, the city of St. Paul, if they want to say no, they can have a vote of their city council and say no. The power is given to each of the cities 
to say yes or no. And you know, not everybody is Minneapolis or St. Paul. We have counties out there that don't have a single tested case positive of COVID-19. So there is judicious use we can make of this tool to recognize a lot of Minnesota is not Minneapolis, St. Paul, and we should recognize that and give fair treatment to people. The liquor stores, and they are working with that, but to be able to save our restaurants in a logical sense of the spirit of what we are doing today done safely. These other amendments I'm sensitive to as well, and I think we should consider working on them and set standards. I know that salons can't do curbside pickup for their products. So someone could go into Walmart, get their shampoo, conditioner, and other hair products, but from their favorite salon, the product that they're accustomed to, that they know purchasing, will help that salon survive. No. That's not right. There are several of these things that we can be sure we protect every single life, every single life has value and purpose. But these businesses have people too. They are people. Let's not talk about them in a non-emotional way like they're just this entity. They are people. And I think that we can do this in a very compassionate way, in a very safe way, and recognize those are people and we can take care of them too. Thank you, Mr. President. Next, we have Senator Ralph, followed by Senator Osmick, followed by Senator Champion. Senator Ralph. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I had a bunch of prepared remarks, and in listening to what's been said here, I think I'm going to depart a little from that script. But I do have some things I do want to say. First of all, I want to thank everyone here for the, the compassion that they're, they're showing in this, this difficult time. It's obvious from the discussion that there are still significant disagreements about what is being done and how it's being done. And I think it's important to keep that in mind as we go forward. I'll speak on the bill in a moment. But I think something we have to think about is when we do look at opening the state up for business again, which we must do, we cannot allow the, disease, the cure for the disease to be worse than the disease. But we have to use logic and reason, not emotion, not sub-agendas or anything else. We have to be, that is our job is to use logic and reason and the values that we were sent here to represent to make these decisions. And I want to just give a couple of examples of where I think that maybe logic and reason has gone out the door and something else is happening. Neptune is wobbling in its orbit. Today I learned that a specialty furniture store or company in this state has been declared a critical industry. And I won't go into the reasoning, but as I read the report, it seemed that much of the justification was fabricated or specious. Regular furniture stores are not considered critical, but they sell virtually the same products. It's just they sell more of them and different kinds. Some of the major retailers sell furniture on their floor. This goes to the basic issue of fairness that we as a state and as, as a society should embrace. We are not being fair or logical here. So I, I, I want to just reiterate what Senator Abler said about and I forget his term, but it basically says what is safe, not what is essential. What can we do that 
allows a business to continue to work, but does not expose customers or employees to unreasonable risks. I will give you another example. And Senator Abler raised this about his cabinet workers, who were in a large warehouse separated by many feet of space, and they were not allowed to continue to work. However, I just learned in looking at the list of critical jobs that casket makers are permitted to work. They are an essential service. And I think, if I think logically, they're doing the same thing a cabinet maker is doing. Again, focusing on the logical inconsistencies that are leading to stress and leading to businesses not being able to operate when they should. The bill here is a good start. Some people have said maybe it favors one business over another. When you really analyze it, it doesn't. The business that they had is gone because of the order, not because of economic forces, not because of competition, not because of any other economic decisions that business made, but because an executive order shut them down and didn't shut other businesses that are involved in the sale of liquor to allow them to come back into the competitive arena, even in a limited capacity, is not picking winners and losers. It's preserving the economic structure of our state. That's why this is a good bill. I, I, I just want to make one more comment, and that is, is that using critical necessity as a, as a standard should not be the only judgment that is made. We must look at the totality of circumstance. And I would hope that the governor and their office, with the critical, I'm sorry, the, the, the critical sectors hotline or email, would be more sensitive to the idea that, oh no, you're just not on the list and therefore we're not going to consider your business, but we'll take a look later on. And that's the email that most of my constituents are getting when they send something to that website or to that email. I would hope that instead of simply saying it's not on the list, they should say, should it be on the list and examine it in that fashion. I thank you very much. Next, we have Senator Osmick, followed by Senator Champion. Senator Osmick. Thank you, Mr. President. It feels a little different standing at my desk without my chair behind me. Uh, we are in very different times. Uh, I want to speak first to the bill and then to the problem we have in Minnesota. Uh, I know there are many well-intentioned amendments. I had my own amendments that I was ready to produce today. Uh, we need to lift the growler cap for business, small businesses in Minnesota. We have a number of very successful breweries in Minnesota which have hit the growler cap. And I think it is the right thing to do to continue to spur that business on. Uh, I think that we need to have a very serious discussion about small containers and what that means to the uh, the, the microbreweries and the, the brew pubs and every small business that has sprouted over my time here in the legislature. It's gone from seemingly little to an incredible wave of small business owners that are providing good jobs for Minnesotans. Uh, and also I have my own bill regarding population cap changes for some licensing that uh, didn't make it into the final cut last year. Uh, but I certainly hope, and I would have loved to have added it to the bill, but I know this is not the time or the place. The governor campaigned on a campaign slogan of one Minnesota. And I'm not going to get too terribly political, but we need to change from one Minnesota to open Minnesota. We need to begin the planning now not two weeks from now, 
not a month from now, we need to begin to get the plan in place through Minnesota's government, that's the legislature working with the governor, to plan out the restart. Because I get the same emails you folks are getting from small business owners. I attend a weekly meeting, or at least I try to, for one of my chambers of commerce in Excelsior. And they are begging. They know what they have to do to run a safe operation. They said, we know we have to sanitize. We know we have to socially distance. We know what we have to do now in the new dynamic of this nation and this state to be able to operate safely because folks, they want their customers to be healthy. They know what they can do. We need to move in that direction. Uh, when it comes to tap rooms, sort of getting back to the bill, we are now entering the season where these small businesses, these small tap rooms that are sprinkled everywhere in Minnesota that are out of work right now, and in some cases pouring product down the drain because they can't sell it, they need to be open. One of my favorite places is up in Nisswa, Big Axe. I strongly suggest if you go up 371, stop, because the guy makes the most incredible beverages, but he can't be open because we have closed down. One size doesn't fit all folks. Uh, my wife, who is very apolitical, a couple, couple mornings ago when the news was on and I wasn't throwing my shoe through the TV set on all things that were happening, mentioned, you know, she said, I, before you got up, I heard how many cases of COVID-19 were reported in, the, in McLeod County. McLeod County is where we both grew up. Just west of here, Senator Newman's territory. Two. Two. And I appreciate Senator Klein. I appreciate your comments. And I understand the problem that we have in the metropolitan area, that we still are having continuous increasing numbers of cases. In McLeod County, two. Why can't we start reopening Minnesota and start with our rural areas that know what they need to do. McLeod County, with two cases, has shut down all their schools. They've shut down a lot of their businesses. For two cases, can that increase? Yes, it can. But we need to have a system in Minnesota that is not a one-size, rigid-fits-all system and brings those voices outside of the seven-county metro area to the Capitol. I have delivered a number of letters from people that have been emailing me to the governor's office pleading, let's find a solution. My challenge to the governor today is this. Call upon members of the legislature from both, the, from both sides of the aisle, from both houses. Let's start the reopening of Minnesota today. Let's start planning for that today because we need to move Minnesota forward, and the only way to do that is to go hand in hand and socially distance ourselves six feet apart. I guess you can't hold, in hand, hold hands hand in hand doing that. We need to start in that direction, and we need to do it today. Thank you, Mr. President. Next on the list is Senator Champion, followed by Senator Nelson. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity to come before this body and talk briefly about some things that I've been hearing uh, that I want to make sure that I could rise and speak to it today. So I'm going to try to be as brief as possible because whenever there's a, a number of things that are on your heart and a number of things that you're thinking about, you sometimes have this desire to want to regurgitate everything that you feel in hopes that it will land upon uh, uh, inviting ears. So I rise to remind us of something. I rise today to remind us of our responsibility during this unprecedented crisis. And I did say our responsibility because I am convinced of something. I'm convinced of the fact that we are dealing with a virus that doesn't discriminate, doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter if you went to Harvard or McAllister, 
doesn't matter if you live in North Minneapolis or on the Iron Range or in Mankato. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It, it doesn't matter if you're an, a CEO or if you're a celebrity like Tom Hanks. It doesn't matter if you're a great basketball player uh, in the NBA. And it doesn't matter if you're in the NFL because it doesn't discriminate. So to me, it is important that we do not lose sight of our, our connectiveness, that we are connected. We might be in different places and spaces, but we are connected by our human spirit. And it, and it is equally as important that as we recognize that, that we rise to the occasion so that we're really clear about how we are making progress. The governor has been a steadfast leader. Every day, getting on television, having meetings throughout the day to make sure that he is leading as a leader here in the great state of Minnesota. And he's reached out to many of us to talk about what are we seeing in our neighborhoods, in our communities? How are they impacted by it? Why? Because he ran on the platform and, and it appears that he believes in the motto, One Minnesota. So when I hear us get on the floor and begin to speak as if the governor is some alien where he doesn't understand the challenges that we all face, then that is challenging to me. So as we advocate for opening our economy and as we think about what is best for small business, that's important because small business owners are the backbone of our economy, but they are part of the fabric of Minnesota. We cannot look only at what we think is important to open up the economy and not be people-centered. We heard Dr. Klein so eloquently talk about things from the healthcare perspective and what he sees and the potential challenges if we don't adhere to doing the right thing. What choices a Dr. Klein would have to make when it comes to individuals not having enough respirators or ventilators or, uh, or our frontline folks not having personal protective equipment. Again, our decisions must be people-centered around health and through a health lens and not just economically driven. Do we want to get back to work? Sure. I know some people who are stir crazy right now. They want to be rescued from their children. <laughs> they want to be rescued from the challenges that they are experiencing because we've never been here before. But let not our circumstances blind us to the reality that we are in this together. We must balance our consideration with the goal of all of us getting through this challenge. And you know what is also key? Words matter. Words really do matter. And I heard Senator Kent read something from one of her constituents. And it reminded me of one of my constituents who wrote me a note on Saturday. And I think this note from her, and I'll just call her Lisa, because that's her first name. I won't give you her last name. But the note from Lisa was, was a wonderful reminder, not just for me, but I hope that the same words that she articulated to me somehow helps you. Here's what she said. She said, Senator, uh, dear Senator Champion, it's a heavy time. I read today that encouraging words to one another can help lift the weight of worry. What an important message for today. In fact, Proverbs 12 and 25 tells us anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. I hope it, it encourages you that I'm praying for you. I also want, want to ask you to choose your words carefully. As people look to you for leadership in the COVID-19 crisis, you can cheer up or tear down. Thank you for all of your hard work you are doing to help and protect us. I'm praying for you. Be encouraged. We are going to emerge from this a stronger nation. 
May you experience peace over this Easter weekend. And the power of those words is that I want to do exactly what she did for me. She lifted me. She reminded me how words are important and that it's important for us to remember that we can get through this and we will get through it together. And I am thankful for the great leadership of Governor Walls, who every day makes sure that he's going to bed, he's having sleepless hours, I know, trying to figure out what's in the best of Minnesota because he cares about Minnesota. And he cares about business as he cares about my wife, who's a pharmacist, as he cares about my son, who's a high school junior. He, scares, he cares about the senior in high school who can't have a prom. Who has to worry about what about that senior trip? Am I going to even be able to walk across the stage? He cares about that college graduate after we spent so much money making sure they can get through college. Now we want nothing else but for them to walk across the stage. He cares about the fact that there's, there are athletes who can't necessarily finish out their careers doing the things that they love. But the one thing I'm reminded of, and I'll finish with this, is every day I get up, I see my son who's in high school at the table doing distant learning. And I see my college student who is finishing up his first year in Colorado also at the table. And my wife who is a, a, a pharmacist leaving the door in order to go make sure that she too is a part of the fight. So we're in it together. So let's encourage each other and let's find the strength to get us through it together, not blame each other. Thank you so much. Next on the list is Senator Nelson, followed by Senator Pratt. Senator Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, today was to be Nurses Day on the Hill. And our nurses aren't here. They're on the front lines, some of them fighting this virus without the PPE that they need. And we would be remiss if we did not thank them today. I thank all, every one of our first responders, our medical people, our nurses who are on that front line fighting for us today. In this pandemic upheaval, it's upended every, every aspect of our lives. And the discussion that we have had on the Senate floor today illustrates that. I'm sure we are all thinking in, in each of these ways. First, I'm reminded of my friend Betty, who died earlier in March. And yet her daughter, Sandy, did not get to be with her mom when she was dying because she couldn't go into that senior living facility. That's a tragic thing for us to see or know or have happen. We have a friend now, Phil, who is, we got the word last night, he is dying from COVID-19. They think he may, might have two days left. These are the real things that Minnesotans are dealing with, and we cannot minimize that. Yet, on the other hand, businesses, mom and pop shop, sole proprietors, small businesses, large businesses, are all suffering. And that suffering is the economic upheaval that we are in the midst of now. I think of the small boutique shop just, just opened up last year, not even a year old. They have a shop now full of winter merchandise. Eventually they're going to get to open, we hope. But their stock is old and discounted, if in fact it can be sold. I'm thinking of those salon owners. My friend Julie, single, she has a single chair. She's been without customers for, excuse me, for weeks now. And I'm also thinking about the larger businesses in my, across my district. I'm thinking about all of those shuttered hotels, the costs of those mortgages, the massive, massive 
property taxes that are due shortly. These are real issues. These are economic issues that are defining us as well. And you know, I'm thinking about our largest private employer in my district, Mayo Clinic. It, too, is being shuttered in some cases by this pandemic. And yet, this is not a, this is not a Sophie's Choice members. It is not that we must choose one and not the other. We need to do both. We need to make sure that Minnesotans are safe, that we have public health measures in place to allow Minnesotans to live their lives, to allow businesses to open that can do so safely with social distancing. This is not a Sophie's choice. We know that we can do the right thing in the worst of times, and I'm calling on us to do that now. We know that there's one thing that is going to help keep Minnesotans safe and get our businesses open. One of the best things we can do is, yes, continue with these social distancing measures, but we need testing. We need to make sure that people can get that COVID-19 test that they need, and more importantly, the newer antibody tests that are being developed national leaders right here in our state. Mayo Clinic, the University of Minnesota are developing and implementing these tests now. We need to make sure that Minnesotans have access to these tests. We get these tests across our state. That, my friends, is how we are going to do the right thing in the worst of times. That is how we can open up Minnesota and we can do so safely. Today there was a bill introduced, uh, Senate File 4476, to do just that, to fund that antibody testing, those treatments that are going to change the course of this pandemic. And I just learned today that in addition to the $200 million that this body several weeks ago appropriated for the COVID-19 fund, which Governor Walls is able to, um, it's under his ability to, uh, to know how to appropriate that money. In addition to that $200 million, we now have $1.2 billion that the feds are sending our way. It is essential that we start now with this needed antibody testing. This is how we can open up Minnesota and do so safely. We cannot afford to wait. We cannot afford to wait because of the health impacts, and we cannot afford to wait because of the economic impacts. So let us move on and do what we need to do and get this funded to get these antibody tests out to Minnesotans who so desperately need them. Thank you. Next, we have Senator Pratt, followed by Senator Swazinski. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. President. During our bipartisan Senate COVID-19 working group, one of the testifiers of a non-essential business talked about the safety protocols developed by the landscapers and nurseries industry. They described how the protocols could keep their employees and their customers from spreading the COVID, the coronavirus using CDC guidelines. And over a week and a half later, the governor finally approved that industry to open. Following that hearing, I sent a letter to Commissioner Grove and the administration to look at whether people could go back to work safely while still slowing the spread of the disease, rather than using an arbitrary essential designation. Now, I haven't heard any of my colleagues blame anyone. I advise the governor and deed that we needed to address both the health crisis 
and the economic crisis concurrently with a more balanced approach. We know the surge of infections, ICU capacity, and fatalities are coming. We can debate whether the levels are right or not, but last week when the governor released his modeling, it became clear that every strategy will roughly seem the same level of ICU patients and unfortunately the same number of deaths. And with almost a half a million Minnesotans out of work, why not take a more balanced strategy while we make our way through the course of this infection? Members, I'm here to support Senator Housley's bill because this is part of a continued effort to support our neighbors that own or work at these Main Street businesses. These are the businesses, these are the, the, the shops that, make our, that keep our communities vibrant and make Minnesota a great place to live and raise a family. So members, I, I encourage a yes vote. Next on the list, we have Senator Swazinski, followed by Senator Senjim. Senator Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. President. I've heard a lot to today about balance, balance, balance. In trying to avert the coronavirus disaster, we find ourselves trying to avert an economic disaster. It's a difficult balancing act. All democracies are constantly trying to balance a variety of issues. I'll be voting yes on this bill today because we face layoffs and furloughs and 20% unemployment rates and our businesses are failing and declaring bankruptcy. We haven't seen an economic situation like this since the Great Depression. And I thank Senator Housley for bringing this bill forward today to try to take one small baby step to try to avert that disaster. But the reason I'm here today is to ultimately thank Governor Waltz because he's telling us daily that every Minnesota life matters. That every single life matters. And no matter what the econ economic disasters that may befall us that are most vulnerable, those that may be more susceptible come first. And I applaud his efforts. But I can't rise today without challenging my colleague, Senator Klein. And he told us earlier today that we're at Bull Run. And being a Civil War buff, I can't let that lie. Because we're not at Bull Run right now, my colleagues. We are at Antietam. We're at Gettysburg. We're at the ultimate worst situation possible in what Lincoln called the truest test for a democracy. And I want to remind everybody that we'll eventually get to Antietam. We'll get there. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort, just like all those 400,000 lives sacrificed during the Civil War. We're going to be sacrificing on this floor as well. We won't have to ultimately give the ultimate sacrifice, but we'll be here, and we will get through this and hopefully the lives of Minnesotans will ultimately be better because of us. Thank you, Mr. President. Next, we have Senator Senjim, followed by Senator Jensen. Senator Senjim. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, a lot of thought in this chamber today, a lot of emotion, certainly a lot of sense of responsibility. And as we look to uh, where we are and where we're going and where we need to get to, uh, I think in each, of our, each and every one of us share emotionally uh, this issue. And each and every one of us care about our people. We care about the health of our people. We care about the prosperity of our people. And so we stand here today searching, thinking, how do we get there? How do we get there? And we don't know. We don't know for sure. This an invisible enemy as we, as we know it, this new virus. Three months ago, we probably couldn't say coronavirus. Now it's every other word. 
But as we think, uh, Mr. President and members, about where we are and uh, what we're doing here today and maybe reflecting back to why we're standing here at this moment, it's because of Senator Housley's bill. And I stand in support of that bill. It's a pretty simple thing uh, in the grand scheme of what we've talked about for the last hour or so, and, uh, and all that has been good and all that's been necessary. But here we have a bill that simply says, uh, can a restaurant owner with a bar sell their alcohol uh, on the street in an off-sale manner, not unlike they sell sandwiches or hamburgers or steaks or anything else? And I think the answer ought to be yes. And then we think about Senator Dietzik and Senator Dibble's bill and Senator Tomasoni's idea. They're good, they're good ideas, too. I would just suggest the governor, in a stroke of the pen this afternoon, could make those happen. We probably can't. But they're good ideas, and they will help people if, in fact, they're implemented. So we ought to think about that. And I'm not going to leave here today without uh, acknowledging Senator Klein, a man on the front lines that got a tough job. Uh, he sees it up front and center every day. It's got to be difficult. It's got to be difficult uh, in a lot of ways, not only academically from a medical point of view, but certainly as an emotional point of view. So, Senator Klein, thank you for your service. Uh, you are a patriot in the truest sense of the military way, and uh, we thank you for your service, as well as all doctors and nurses across Minnesota, because they are the guardians of, of medicine right now and, and so important to, to where we are and, again, where we hope we can go. So, so let's make it through this, folks. Uh, we will. Uh, let's start today by acknowledging Senator Housley's bill and passing out of the floor and continuing to do common sense things. This is all about common sense. It's all about, Senator Klein would know this, in the way it's about operating room asepsis. You know, you can do this stuff with good training, good knowledge, good equipment, good barriers and things like that. And we have to do this stuff, and I think we can. So let's move forward uh, deliberately. We don't need to... Uh, got out in front of ourselves, I don't think, but we need to be smart about this, and I think we're approaching it the right way, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and uh, we move on. And I congratulate this, this chamber today, because I think more than any time in my 18 years, I, there's a sense of overall feeling here. There's a sense of Minnesota. There's a sense of need and direction. We need to keep this up. If we do, if we can talk together like this, we will get there. Be assured, we will get there. Next, we have Senator Jensen, followed by Senator Housley. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Housley, for bringing this bill forward. It has my support. If the conversation we have today can galvanize the elected leaders of Minnesota to work together and to get Minnesota going again, it's worth it. Have we experienced some piercing darts? Have we used words that maybe could have been more sensitively chosen? I think so. I think Senator Champion said we should try to choose our words wisely. Two or three weeks ago when Senator Klein put a commentary in the strip, closing his document with the words, beyond irresponsible, referring to a position I held. Now it's piercing. Senator Klein and I have worked together for four years. I'm proud of a lot of the work we've done together. And in the last few days, we finished the insulin bill. And while Senator Klein may not have been given much outward credit for that, he and Senator Marty and many others in the Democratic caucus contributed to that mightily. I like to think that the Senate benefits from having two physicians in the chamber. First time in 25 years, Senator Klein and I have chuckled about that. One Democrat, one Republican, one hospitalist, one family doc. Senator Klein speaks passionately. I appreciate that. I see the world differently than he does. I just got off the phone checking with Minnesota Hospital Association, multiple administrators around the state. We have, in this state, a 1,000 ICU beds. 
Currently, 100 of them are being used. We have capacity. We have almost 1,500 ventilators in Minnesota. Currently, we're using about 100 of them. We are starting to learn that the use of ventilators, which we were thinking was a good thing four weeks ago, needs to be reconsidered because just jacking up the pressure inside the lungs doesn't necessarily get people better. The fact of the matter is we've doubled the death rate on ventilator use over the last four weeks than what we used to do. We used to expect one out of three people that got on a vent would be dead and not be able to get off. Now we expect two out of three to be dead and not be able to get off. So if for one minute we don't think that at the end of this, and there is going to be an end to this, we're going to have ventilators unpacked sitting on the pallet. We have the capacity to handle right now, this state, what's going to come down the pike. Senator Gazelka said last night on a radio program, TV program, using the governor's numbers, using the Minnesota model, if we stay with what we're doing, a stay at home for everybody, we will peak in July, requiring approximately 3,000 beds at our peak and having somewhere around 20,000 deaths, I believe. I could have some of those numbers wrong. But what's important is that if we pivot and we say we are going to continue to protect and have a stay-at-home recommendation for self-quarantining for that vulnerable group of people that are over the age of 70 with multiple comorbidities, not much changes. The number of deaths stays approximately the same. The number of hospital beds required at the surge stays the same. We push the peak back one month. Well, that might sound good, but you know what? We're ready for the surge right now because right now what we're doing is we're forgetting about mind, body, and soul. We're just focusing on the body. But there's people out there dying of suicides, and there's people out there engaging in more physical and emotional abuse than we've had before. So the fact of the matter is, we need to think about those numbers and those people who are not showing up on that nifty dashboard that we look at every day. We can incrementally move forward tomorrow and we can do it cautiously and continue to do the same kinds of things that were done when the bubonic plague was hitting the world in the 13 and 1400s because frankly, folks, not that much has changed. You think those people back in the 1300s weren't practicing social distancing? They had it before we said it was six feet. You think they weren't self-quarantining? Of course they were. You think they weren't trying to observe and measure and see what could they do better? They noticed that that, that household down the road who boiled their water before they drank it seemed to do better? Go back and review your Albert Camus and read about the plague. But again, I'll say it. If today's conversation can galvanize us to continue to try to work together, because if Senator Klein and I can insult one another and tomorrow work again to try to do something good, then we all can. This is not about picking on any one person or any one branch of government. This is about mind, body, and spirit, and we have to broaden the perspective. Senator Klein sees a different kind of patient than I do. He's a hospitalist. I had a patient in on Monday, mild chest pain. He had it when he got out of bed. He had it when he walked. EKG showed significant changes. I told him, I'm really worried about you because you don't complain much. He said, ah, oh, don't worry about it, doc. I think it's just a little indigestion. I said, let me get on the phone with the cardiologist. I called the cardiologist and said, this patient needs an angiogram. Yeah, doc, I'd love to do that for you. But you know, in this day and age with COVID-19, we are doing everything we can to keep people out of the cath lab. So I said, so you're not going to do an angiogram? No, he said, we'll do a different test. So we did an intermediary test that does put the patient's life at risk. Thankfully, the patient survived the test. Unfortunately for the patient, he has more than 95% blockage in three different vessels. So he's going to have his chest cracked open. And thankfully, he's alive to have the procedure done. But the fact of the matter is, this COVID thing has cast a spell. 
I have women waiting to have their breast lump cut out because someone's considering it elective. Now, I know that's not Governor Walls that's considering an elective, but it bleeds out onto the way we do things. We are not doing the things we normally do. Nobody wants to cross the line. We all want to do the right thing. So please, let's do what the doctor does. Let's get a second opinion. Let's make sure that when we hear what we hear, we try to get outside that echo chamber I don't know if it happens to Dr. Klein, but it happens to me. There are times where I just miss something important. And if I can get another set of eyes, another set of hands, and check that belly out differently, they get the diagnosis right and I had it wrong. But a second opinion means a second opinion. We've got to step away from the people that are just echoing our own thoughts. Because if all I do is go to the nurse and say, boy, didn't you think this, didn't you think that, that's not a second opinion. That's groupthink. So, Senator Klein, your words today were provoking. But it provoked us outside of groupthink. So, thank you. And for context's sake, I just want to say one thing. The CDC came out and said, there will probably be about 60,000 cases of flu this year that end in death. 60,000 deaths this year in this country. Hospitalizations, we may well have three quarters of a million hospitalizations this year from flu. We will have more than 50 million Americans have flu this year. And you know what? We didn't shut the country down. Next on the list is Senator Housley, followed by Senator Gazelka. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we've heard a, a lot of uh, heart-wrenching stories here on the floor today, and uh, we are all getting these calls and texts and, and emails. I was on a Zoom call this morning with my own chamber, and similar stories, family businesses going under, uh, people struggling to pay their rent. Um, it's tough. These are really, really tough times. Um, and I wish, I wish this bill could do more. I wish it could open up Minnesota while keeping us all safe. But we can only do a little bit at a time. At a time. And this is what it is today. It's allowing bars and restaurants to be able to have beer and wine to go. Little, little bits. Not going to help everybody. Would love to help lift the growler cap. I'd like to thank Senator Dames for, <laughs> we'll see how he votes. I'd like to thank, thank Senator Dames for putting up with me through all of this. Um, but it is, it is so important that we do what we can to help our small businesses. And this is, this is it for today. Um, and I'm hoping for a green vote. Thank you. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, I'm supportive of this bill. It's a, a sliver of hope. It's something that we can do. We could do so much more. Uh, and I'm going to combine some of my comments uh, just to save some time. I heard about the, the battle theme, uh, and I've been talking about this as a battle. And frankly, if this is uh, where we're at right now, if we're talking about uh, the Civil War, this is more like Pickett's Charge. And we have things moving on and we maybe don't see all the data yet and as a result of that we're causing great harm but i think it's more like world war ii in the battle of bulge, of the bulge uh, where americans were surrounded and they wanted us to give up and we said no and said the, in fact the commander said nuts that was the expression that he gave we're not going to do it and in the end that was the last offensive moment uh, that the, that uh, the Germans had. That was the last point. And I think uh, nationwide, I think if we haven't reached the peak, we're just about over that peak, the last moment where from here we, we begin to move forward. And I wanted to talk about it as a battle because I often use it as a battle. And in, in the beginning of the battle, there is that shock and awe moment where this great wave of unknowns surrounds everyone and everybody hunkers down. Everybody jumps into the foxhole. Everybody isn't sure what to do 
other than self-preservation. But eventually the smoke begins to lift and you start to see the reality. And one of the realities that we see right now is in the first month in Minnesota, 460, I'm sorry, in the last 30 days, 464,000 unemployment claims. 464,000 un unemployment claims as businesses have been shut down and people are sheltered and home. And the smoke is starting to lift and we're saying, are we on the right path? I'm saying, are we on the right path? I believe the governor's probably saying, am I on the right path? So here's the numbers right now, 94 deaths in Minnesota, 94, 94 important lives. The average age is 87. The average, average age is 87. The youngest person that's died in Minnesota of COVID-19 is 56, and virtually all of them had something very, very serious that combined with that. And so how do we fight COVID-19 and protect our livelihood. I, I think it is a balance. I think we can do both. And I would say, well, let's just look at the governor's own University of Minnesota model that we finally got last Friday. And you've, you've heard it mentioned here, but I want to, to highlight it because it's very important. There's a number of directions we could have gone and where we should have gone. And one of those directions was shelter at home, just the vulnerable, which is what I've been saying since before the first shelter at home. The vulnerable, particularly people over 70, are the ones that are clearly at risk, and we need to figure out a way to keep them safe. And if we went that model right now and, and changed, didn't change the other numbers, the number of beds that they show that we need at the peak is 3,700, a little over 3,000, and the number of deaths is 22,000 people. And keep in mind that first we heard that there was going to be millions of deaths. That was the shock and awe. The governor said 74,000 deaths in Minnesota if we do nothing. That was about three weeks ago. Uh, if we did shelter in place, it was 40,000 deaths. Now it's down to 22,000 deaths. That number is becoming clearer and clearer, and the good news is better and better. But if, if we just shelter at home seniors, primarily seniors and a few others, 22,000 deaths under their model and 3,700 beds needed. Those are the exact same numbers, members, the exact same numbers. If we continue on this path of three and a half more weeks of sheltering at home everyone, 22,000 deaths, 3,700 beds. So if I have a choice of one or the other and the data that I'm looking at, what, would I, what should I choose? Well, I should lift the shelter in place for everybody but those that are vulnerable, and I should ask everybody to follow the CDC guidelines, which I think we all get now. Wash your hands, cover your cough. If you're sick, sick stay at home. If you, you need to have distancing of six feet. If we all did that, businesses and the individuals, and we sheltered seniors at home and the others that are vulnerable, we get to the same end. That's the battle against COVID-19, but that helps the battle to save our economy because we get through it quicker. And instead of a peak in July, the peak is in June. So we can get through this quicker. And that's why I raise, raise this warning over and over again. And I ask the governor, please reconsider. We can take businesses and say, you have to show us that you can practice safe distancing. You're in. I'd rather say everybody's in and we say no to those that can't do it safely. And so members, this is a small step. We're helping some restaurants. I, like Thomas Sony said, we're not really picking winners and losers. We're helping losers lose less because they're all in this and, and suffering from this. But this is a small step. I support it. But I hope the governor is listening. And let's, let's keep moving towards opening these things up and follow your own advice from the University of Minnesota that says we can shelter at home just the seniors and vulnerable and get to the same place. Members, we're on final passage of Senate File 4489. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll.
come back. Okay. Are we good? No, we're good. Members in the retiring room, please come to the chamber and vote at your own desk. Members in the East Gallery, please make your way down. While they're making their way down, members in the President's office, please come to the chamber and vote. Members in Capitol Room 303 can make their way down to the chamber, and while they're on their way, members in Capitol Room 237 can come to the chamber and vote, please. And members in room 323, capital room 323, please make your way to the chamber and vote. I will now call on Senator Kent to report the votes for members who are voting remotely under Rule 40.7. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. I report an aye for Senator Jim Carlson. Senator Carlson votes aye. 
Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Greg Clausen. Senator Clausen votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Chris Eaton. Senator Eaton votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Nick Frentz. Senator Frentz votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Jason Isaacson. Senator Isaacson votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Carolyn Lane. Senator Lane votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Ron Latz. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Matt Little. Senator Little votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Jerry Newton. Senator Newton votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Sandy Pappas. Senator Pappas votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Ann Rest. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Dan Sparks. Senator Sparks votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Patricia Torres Ray. Senator Torres Ray votes aye. Senator Kent. I report an aye for Senator Melissa Wickland. Senator Wickland votes aye. I will now call on Senator Gazelka to report the members voting remotely under Rule 40.7. Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bruce Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson B votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Gary Dames votes aye. Senator Dames votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Dan Hall votes aye. Senator Hall votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Bill Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Scott Newman votes aye. Senator Newman votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Kerry Rood votes no. Senator Rood votes no. Senator Gazelka. Senator Dave Senjum votes aye. Senator Senjum votes aye. Senator Rosen votes. Uh, Senator Gazelka. Senator Bill Weber votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Gazelka, please state how Senator Rosen voted. Excuse me. Senator Rosen votes aye. Senator Rosen votes aye. Senator Gazelka. And Senator Tory Westrom votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the Secretary will close the roll. There being 65 ayes and two nays, the bill is passed and it's titled agreed to. Remaining under motions and resolutions, we'll proceed to the confirmation calendar. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I move that the report from the Committee on Higher Education, Finance, and Policy reported March 2, 2020, pertaining to appointments, be taken from the table. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Opposed say no. We will pause and get the votes from the alternate locations. Receiving a sufficient number of aye votes, the motion prevails. <laughs> Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the foregoing report be now adopted. 
on the Anderson motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Again, we will pause to gather the votes from the alternate locations. Receiving a sufficient number of aye votes, the motion prevails. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that in accordance, uh, in accordance with the report from the Committee on Higher Education Finance and Policy reported March 2, 2020, the Senate, having given its advice, do now consent to the confirmation uh, and confirm the appointment of Os Office of Higher Education Commissioner Dennis Olson. Members, when Discussion Commissioner on that motion, Senator okay. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, when Commissioner Olson appeared before the Higher Education Committee on February 27th for his confirmation hearing, there wasn't one critical comment of the commissioner or his work, only strong bipartisan gratitude and praise. Based on our close working relationship over the past 15 months, I was not surprised in the least. Over his career, Commissioner Olson has broad professional experience in education, starting as an undergraduate research assistant working on youth summer programs, curriculum development, and collecting data on student retention while a student at the University of Minnesota. He served as Commissioner of Education for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe and as State Director of Indian Education at the Minnesota Department of Education. In addition, he provided further executive leadership as the executive director of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. As commissioner of the Higher Educa uh, Office of Higher Education, he leads an agency that helps more than 425,000 students gain access to post-secondary education annually through outreach, education, and providing access to nearly a dozen financial aid programs, including the state grant program. Additionally, he leads an extensive research and analysis mission and manages the licensing and registration of nearly Minnesota's nearly 200 institutions of higher education. In his, in his dealings with the Senate and the Higher Education Committee more specifically, Commissioner Olson, Olson has been accessible, he has been open to discussion and new ideas, and he has been collaborative. All things I've greatly appreciated, and on a personal level, I've truly enjoyed working with him. In closing, members, I know this body understands and appreciates the critical importance and value higher education is to the prosperity and success of our society, our economy, and our state. The benefits of his work and that of his team can already be seen in the students and institutions of today, but will be even more evident in our communities, our workforce, and our leaders well into the future. The people of Minnesota would be very, very well served by Commissioner Olson remaining in his post, and I'm thankful that someone of his caliber and, the, and character is willing to serve in public office. We need to honor and encourage it from, the, from our best and brightest. And I also want to note, members, that uh, Senator Claussen, our minority lead on the, on the Higher Education Committee, has uh, sent an email to all individuals that reflects uh, much of the same words that, that I'm giving today. So members, I ask you to please join me in supporting uh, Dennis Olson's confirmation as Commissioner of the Office of Higher Education, and I renew my motion, Mr. President. Further discussion on the motion, Senator Cohen. Um, <clears throat> Mr. President and, and members, um, as Senator Anderson indicated, Senator Clausen is our minority lead on, on the committee, which I also serve on, and Senator Clausen is not able to be here today. He's asked me to, to, uh, to read of the statements that he did prepare on behalf of the confirmation of uh, Commissioner Olson. So if I might, uh, Mr. President, as the Senate Higher Education Committee Minority Lead, I am pleased to offer my support to confirm Dennis Olson, Jr. 
as Minnesota Office of Higher Education Commis Commissioner. Mr. Olson has spent much of his career in education, holding previous leadership positions at the Minnesota Department of Education, University of Minnesota, and Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. Throughout his distinguished career, Mr. Olson has demonstrated leadership in advancing higher education access and opportunity for all students. Minnesota has a history of valuing higher education and the commitment of our colleges and universities in building an educated workforce. Raised and educated, educated Minnesota, Mr. Olson is a product of that commitment. He is dedicated to narrowing Minnesota's higher education achievement gaps to meet the needs of today's workforce and has demonstrated the ability to bring community leaders together from across the state to address this issue. It has become clear through his interactions with the Senate Higher Education Committee that Mr. Olson deeply cares about students. During his tenure, Mr. Olson has maintained the mission of the Office of Higher Education in providing and expanding student financial aid programs, continued serving as the state clearinghouse for data research and analysis on post-secondary enrollment, monitored institutional trends, and restructured oversight responsibilities while providing leadership to the state attainment goal process. Mr. Olson has the credentials, demonstrated experience, and personal relationship building skills to provide the necessary innovative leadership to the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. I am pleased to recommend and support Mr. Olson's confirmation as the Minnesota Office of Higher Education Commissioner, signed Senator Gregory Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, any further discussion? Seeing none, Senator Anderson renews his motion to confirm Dennis Olson as Office of Higher Education Commissioner. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, say no. We will again take a brief pause to gather the votes in the alternate locations. Receiving a sufficient number of aye votes, the motion prevails. Remaining under motions and resolutions, the secretary will read an author's motion. Senator Abler moves that his name be stricken as chief author, shown as co-author in the name of Senator Nelson, be added as chief author of Senate file number 4369. To the author's motion, all those in favor say aye. Opposed say no. We will again take a brief pause to gather the votes in the alternate locations. Yeah, I got three.
Receiving a sufficient number of I votes, motion prevails. Remaining under motions and resolutions, the Secretary will read Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 7. Senators Gazelka and Kent introduce, a, introduce Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 7 relating to adjournment of the Senate and the House of Representatives until the public interest warrants reconvening. Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, I move that Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 7 be adopted. To that motion, Senator Gazelka. Uh, member, Senate Resolution Number 7 provides authority for the House and Senate to adjourn more than three days if needed with a return date of April 28th. This resolution would allow the leader of either body to bring that chamber back into daily session before April 28th if the other body is notified along with the leader of the other party. This is much like the previous resolution for adjournment, more than three days, but provides more independence to each body to act independently. Uh, members, uh, the, the speaker asked me if they, if the House could have some more flexibility. I've told you all that we intend to meet every three days. Uh, I, I, in the end, I felt like in the spirit of goodwill, we would uh, offer them the ability to decide how to best run their House. Uh, I do think that it's important that we meet every three days. Uh, in, we're going to do a number of the, the um, uh, confirmation of, of commissioners and, and uh, go through that as part of the process that we have to do and uh, work through the bills. There's three key, three key things I think that we need to work on as well. One is a modest bonding bill. The second one is what do we do with oversight with all the federal dollars coming in. And the third one is what, what are we doing related to tax policy and how we can uh, spur the economy. And so we need to continue to work together. We think that we should be meeting every three days as long as we follow MDH guidelines and CDC guidelines uh, in how we present that. But at the same time, if the House has a, a different desire for how they want to get their work done, I want to leave that up to them. Further discussion, Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I uh, support this resolution and uh, I uh, encourage members to support it as well. I think it is wonderful that we are giving the House the flexibility to manage their safety and operations. Um, but I want to reiterate, as I have in the past, my concerns that um, we can potentially do our work, we can do our confirmations, we can go through our bills and potentially do it without meeting so often. And I hope that this flexibility will allow us to make the judgments on occasion if we don't have an adequate agenda that we can postpone and, and, and organize our, our efforts uh, to minimize the time that we spend together and then go back out into our communities having been in this environment. Um, I appreciate that we're doing good um, physical distancing. Um, some of us are wearing masks, but being in this physical space, in the nature of this space, um, I do believe puts us at risk and therefore the people that we go back and be, are in contact with. Thank you. Further discussion, Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and uh, Senator Kent and, and to all senators, if there are things that we can do in this format uh, to provide more uh, safety, uh, your, your comments are, are well taken and certainly speak to me or the President. Mm -hmm. Senator Gazelka renews his motion to adopt uh, Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 7. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. no. Again, we'll take a brief pause to gather the votes in the alternate locations.
receiving a sufficient number of aye votes, the motion prevails. Continuing to the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interest. Any announcements of Senate interest? Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Senator Cohn from 11.45 to 11.55 a.m. Any announcements? Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, April 20th at 11 a.m. Senator Gazelka moves that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, April 20th, 2020 at 11 a.m. All those in favor say aye. Opposed say no. Motion prevails. The Senate is adjourned.